Hi, this is Professor Cummings, and this is a brief video on geometric dimension and tolerance, and or also known as GDNT. And what I want to cover in this video is some of the basics of why you want to use GDNT, what some of the benefits are, and how you utilize GDNT to set up a particular part so you can go through the manufacturing and inspection process. So why do you use GDNT? Well, there's three basic reasons, or three basic elements of GDNT. One, it helps communicate part intent and function through the design, manufacturing, and inspection. What that, what does that mean? What that means is that when you're designing the component, when you're manufacturing the component, when you're inspecting the component, what you're able to do is see how the part is put together and understand what the relevancy of the features are in relationship to each other. It also helps you do a standard with how you set the part up when you manufacture it as well as when you inspect it. It also provides a more precise depiction of part features. So what this GDNT will do is it will help you understand how certain features in your component are actually going to be precisely measured with relationship to their use. And third, it focuses on feature-to-feature -feature relationships. GDNT, the components of GDNT actually help you understand how one feature interacts with another feature. You know, and how what is the most important aspect of that feature, or the most important uh, series of aspects of that feature that help you with that that relationship to other features. So it helps you get a better understanding of what GDNT is. And it helps you understand, you know, develop an inspection method or a manufacturing method that is consistent. So nobody's just winging it. Everybody's doing everything the same way. And you end up knowing if a part is good or bad or manufactured poorly because everybody followed the same standard method. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this component. And that's the standard down below. We're going to look at this particular component. And we're going to just go through an exercise using this component and how we would actually utilize GD&D to our advantage. So what would it take to set this part up and be compliant with the standard of ge geometric dimension and tolerancing? So we have this part, a fairly simple component. I use this component in some of my classes. You know, I like it because it is very, very basic, but it still covers a lot of the essential aspects of GDNT. One of the things that you want to start off with with GDNT is understanding the whole concept of a datum. All a datum is, is a starting point or a, a primary measuring point. Maybe primary isn't the best word, but a measuring point that you're going to start from. So a, a zero point on a feature that you're going to take all your other measurements from. And typically, you have a primary, secondary, and tertiary datum. So primary, secondary, and tertiary datum. Not always. Sometimes you may just have one datum on your component. Sometimes you may have two. But you know these are the, the datums that you want to be aware of. Now, the way you know a datum is typically it is depicted as a flag with a letter in it. So in this case, you've got datum A, which depicts this side of your component, you got datum B, which depicts this side of your component, and then you've got datum C, which depicts this side of the component. So the flag actually rests on the part of the component that is considered the datum. So again, these three parts, these three components, are what's known as the datums of this component, whatever this component happens to be, this widget here. And we know those are the, the starting points for any measurements that we're going to take. Another thing to keep in mind is the basic dimension. Now, one thing you I want you to notice in this uh, picture here is that you don't see a lot of tolerancing. You know, a lot of tolerancing either on these dimensions that depict the distance between these holes, these dimensions that depict the, or this dimension that depicts the distance from the hole to this side, or this particular one from the hole to, to this side. When you have this box around these dimensions, these are what's known as basic dimensions. So what that tells the inspector or the person measuring this or, or setting this up to be machine is that you are going to get all of your tolerancing from your control frame. And we'll go in more into what the control frame actually is later. So you just have to have a basic dimension 
over for, for the rest of these features because where this these holes actually land is going to be controlled in another method. So they're not going to be controlled through a tolerance. Another purpose for these datums, you know, this A, B, and C, is to know how the part actually gets set up. Now it's not just set up in the in the work holding for the the machine, you know, when it's actually going through a machining process, or in this case probably a mill or a lathe or, or something. It's also the work holding for fixturing. Again, remember I said this is a standard, and it's make sure everybody does it the same way. So what you have is this this thing called a a a well it's a fixture, a uh, geometric counterpart true geometric counterpart and you're following something known as the 321 rule. The 321 rule actually helps you understand how this sets up in inside of the fixture. So the 321 rule is essentially saying you're going to have three datum points on one side. This establishes a plane, two datum points on another side which establishes a line and then one datum point on one end here which establishes just a point on the part. Once you've got this 3 two, one rule you're able to set the part into whatever fixture or nest you, you're going to be inspecting in or machining in and know that you've restrained the movement. Now that's an important concept this whole idea of restraining movement. Let's go a little bit more into that. So again we have our true geometric counterpart right here depicted in the 3 two, one rule kind of laid out. Again remember the 3 two, one rule is just three points on one side, two points on the other, and one point on the other. And here we have our, our part that we're actually discussing. And we've got our three datums. So a datum A, a datum B, and a datum C. And that's the name of this. This is a true geometric counterpart and all this is is just a fancy way of saying the component that this uh, part is going to be sitting in, whether it's an inspection nest or whether it's a, a work holding for a machine. And you've got the 3 two, one rule that we've actually discussed. So we're looking at a plane, a line, and a point. So three points establish a plane, two points establish a line, and one point establishing a point. That's to restrain it. Now this next rule I want to bring up is the right hand rule. Now the right hand rule is important in inspection. Because what it establishes is your x, y, and z axis. X, y, and z axis. So it'll, what's how it's traveling in one direction, or excuse me, your your three axis of, of movement. Now the reason that's important is because it brings up an idea known as degrees of freedom. Now any part that you have, you know, anything in existence has a certain degrees of freedom. All degrees of freedom mean is the ability for your part to take into motion where it can move. The whole idea of a true geometric counterpart, this true geometric counterpart, is to restrict the degrees of freedom. And it restricts the degrees of freedom by using the 3 two, one rule. So in this case, some of the degrees of freedom that a part has, you know, like I said, six degrees of freedom, is you can have movement in the x-axis, so movement left and right, movement in the y-axis, movement up and down, and movement side to side in the z-axis. Now how does this play in with the 3 two, one rule and the degrees of freedom? So if you have uh, taking, oh excuse me, I have three other areas of degrees of freedom which is just rotation. You know, so the one type is rotation about one axis, rotation about the y-axis, and rotation about the z-axis. So that makes up your six degrees of freedom. So you've got these six degrees of freedom. Now this, getting back to the 3 two, one rule, how does this work out? So if you have 3 to one rule, what happens if we were to put three points below a part to establish a plane? The first thing we would do is we resist the ability to go up and down because you've got a bottom now, you know, a plane near the bottom. You also resist the ability to rotate about two of the axes. So it won't rotate around this x-axis and it'll have it won't have the ability to rotate about the z-axis. All because you've got three points. So three points at the bottom. So that's the first part of the 3 two, one rule. You just eliminated, you know, three degrees of freedom. You know, an up and down and a rotation about two axes. The second part of the 3 two, one rule, which is the two points, is putting the two stops here, establishing that line. What that does is it uh, event prevents 
motion going from left to right in the z-axis and also rotation about the y-axis because it's restricted now by these two stops. And then of course you've got the last point which is the 1, the 3, 2, 1 down here on this end. It, what that does is it stops motion going in and out. So all that does is stop 1 going in and out. The second two points stops the rotation about y and moving left and right so that's three points and then of course the planular the three points which stops it from rotating about x and y or excuse, yeah x and z as well as going up and down so with three two one it actually restricts your degrees of freedom so in theory your part can't move if you have uh, the proper geometric counterpoint or counterpart which means that the part won't move when you start to machine it and it won't move and adjust when you start to inspect it. So you have an accurate part. You won't have to worry about over machining, you know, cutting too much material off. You won't have to worry about the part moving when you inspect it and giving you false readings. Now let's consider this part and consider the next point. So again, still looking at this part, we've gone over how we're going to hold it, how we're going to restrict it. Now it's time to start looking at this guy here. And this is the part of GD&T that everybody is most familiar with. It's the part that you know people don't normally think of the, the rest of it, but they do remember this. So let's look at this guy and we built put a little box on it and I blew it up over here over to the left. So it's just the same feature, just you know drawn out a little bit bigger. And this is what's known as the control frame. The control frame is all the information you're gonna need to know what's going on for the rest of the feature. Like I said, your tolerances are not on this drawing. You've got some datums that are showing up on this drawing and you know, you've got a basic idea as to how you're going to hold it. But all your information as to what everything means comes, comes from this control frame. So let's go through what these purpose, our points in the control frame mean. The first box in the control frame is what's known as your geometric characteristics. This is what's telling you what exactly you're trying to measure or how you're trying to measure it. The symbol here is what's known as a true position symbol, and we'll go into that in, in future videos, but it's a true position uh, you know, feature, and what that geometric characteristic tells you is when we look at this hole, you know, how we're going to inspect it with relation to the rest of the part. In this case, just true position is you know, how far it stays true to a particular center. The next box is called your tolerance zone. Now this is also a part of a very important part of GDNT for a couple of reasons. One, it gives you the information for how this thing is, is getting measured. But the whole idea of a tolerance zone is it, it creates a radius or excuse me, a diameter around, in this case, the feature in in question. In this case, this the, the, the center of this circle and lets you know how much of an area, how much of a tolerance you're able to stay within in order to create still have a a good part so what this is telling us is we've got sixty thousandths sorry sixty thousand inches where we can have this hole move around and still be considered good so again so this is just the the tolerant zone which gives us an area for for how this part can move and it also uh, is a lot more useful in manufacturing and inspection because not only do you still have a good part that can still mate because it's done with re relative to certain other features, particularly the datums, it, it also allows for a lot more acceptance of other parts and still maintaining a good part. And the last part here is very important. It's the datums. So you can see you've got a datum A, B, and C. And over here, you've got them called out as A, B, and C. And this is why we call them primary, secondary, and tertiary datums. The first one being primary, second secondary, and third the tertiary. So the order that they show up in is very important because what this order tells us when we set up our fixtures, whether it's a machining fixture or an inspection fixture, where we set the three, the two, and the one. So that's our primary datum, our secondary datum, and our tertiary datum. So this lets us know how this has to be set up. So no matter who you send this to, if they can see the GDNT in your drawing, they will, and they know how to comply to GDNT, you know, this particular standard, they will set this up the same way. They'll have a fixture that can hold this on the datum A with three points, 
datum B with two points and datum C with one point. They'll know to inspect this hole with a true position tolerance and they'll know that these are just basic dimensions. So this is Professor Cummings. If this video was helpful to you or if you want to see future videos on GD&T and other engineering, particularly manufacturing uh, issues or uh, topics, go ahead and hit the like button. Go ahead and subscribe. Also, you could go and look at my Facebook page, which will be in the low bar, as well as my Google Plus page. Both of those I update with different engineering information as well as videos and other types of things to help give some clarification as to manufacturing processes and manufacturing uh, methods and in, as well as in, engineering in general methods. So thanks for watching my video and I'll see you next time.